So Luther, more about this misery, he's doing all the sacraments, all the penance. He drove his confessors crazy because he was so conscientious, he would go into confession and he would confess for hours because he wanted to make sure if I'm forgetting something and I'm on the hook to tell him so he can tell me how to atone for that. If I forget, I'm on the hook for that sin. I'm in, I'm in deadly peril before God. And so he would confess for hours until his confessor would get sick of it there in the monastery and like, get out, that's enough. And Luther would either, sometimes he would be dejected because he would think, surely I forgot something. How could I, a, a sinful man, possibly uh, give a full accounting, a full inventory of every little sinful thought I've had? And if he came out feeling good, I think I did remember everything. Then he'd feel bad because he'd think, well, certainly I'm, that's not the case. I'm probably being prideful over remembering uh, all my sin when I probably didn't. And because it was all on him to perform, uh, he, his, his misery, his despair was well-founded, right? Because he recognized the righteous God described in the scriptures. And he recognized, I can't even begin to remember all my sins, to confess them sufficiently to figure out how to atone for them. So he would go through horrible bouts of depression and despair, uh, but he took a, a university position that allowed him to study the Bible at great length because that was what they wanted him to teach, and he was stoked about that. And as you say, Luther, the thing that distinguished him, I'm, I'm sure he wasn't the only person in despair in this system, but the thing that he had is access to the Bible and advanced training in the languages in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And so it was coming to the book of Romans, and specifically in Romans chapter 1, where he saw the simplicity of the gospel that had been obscured by this crushing structure. And here's how he describes that discovery. As a monk, I led an irreproachable life. Nevertheless, I felt that I was a sinner before God. My conscience was restless, and I could not depend on God being propitiated by my satisfactions. Not only did I not love, but I actually hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. Thus a furious battle raged within my perplexed conscience. But meanwhile, I was knocking at the door of this particular Pauline passage. As we'll see in a moment, he's talking about a passage in Romans 1. Earnestly seeking to know the mind of the great apostle, Day and night, I tried to meditate upon the significance of these words. The righteousness of God is revealed in it. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Then finally, God had mercy on me. And I began to understand that the righteousness of God is a gift of God by which a righteous man lives, indicating that the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now I felt as though I had been reborn altogether. Good choice of words, huh? <laughs> Biblical language. And had entered paradise. In the same moment, the face of the whole scripture became apparent to me. Just as intensely as I have now hated the expression, the righteousness of God, I now lovingly praise this most pleasant word. This passage from Paul became to me the very gate to paradise. Don't you love it? So simple, so clear. And it was seeing, yes, God is unapproachably righteous, but he gives us that righteousness freely when we simply trust in Jesus because Jesus has paid for our sins in full. And everything else, all these additions and accretions had buried the hope of the gospel in a hopeless system of works-based religion. 